Welcome to the first installation of my series decoding the simulated universe lore. I plan to cover all simulated universe events, including future ones, so I figured I may as well turn it into a series. This video is mostly introductory in that I'll be covering the events leading up to the swarm disaster and introducing the major players, both Eon and Mortal, as well as some of the themes and inspirations that aid in comprehension at this point. Do note that I've done most of this work by myself with only a whiteboard and a dream, so some of the content is definitely up for interpretation. With that said, let's jump straight into it. At the beginning of Swarm Disaster in the prologue, we're technically first introduced to the Eon Enna. Note that this introduction is called Order, despite containing content mostly about Tazeron. The devlog about Enna describes them as a control freak that governed planets with staunchly adhered to rules. Their rule hindered calamities and developed civilizations extremely sufficiently, but those civilizations eventually collapsed. Its presence was always accompanied by the ethereal melodies of the Beyond the Sky choir that form Enna's voice. Note that Enna appears to be heavily inspired by Christian mythology and takes imagery in particular from figures such as the Virgin Mary. This is a good time to point out that Enna is also likely not this puppet, but rather the giant eye in the background that pulls the strings. Giant eyes are a common way to depict gods, and in this case I believe it is alluding to one of the biblically accurate depictions of angels. The accompanying Beyond the Sky Choir is an allusion to the Choir of Heavenly Angels, which surround the throne of God, singing his praises and are also said to be his messengers. This is the first clue that this simulated universe gives. Despite the name of Swarm Disaster, this isn't really a story about Tazeronth. This is a story about Enna, inspired by the Old Testament book of Exodus, specifically an event called the Ten Plagues of Egypt. For those unfamiliar in the story of Moses, most famous for the parting of the Red Sea, the people of God, the Israelites, are enslaved by the Egyptian pharaoh. To cut a long story short, Moses is tasked by God with freeing the Israelites, but the pharaoh makes that very difficult. God sends the ten plagues as a demonstration of his power, which forces the pharaoh to allow his people to leave. The eighth disaster is the most relevant. This is the locust swarms. To quote the passage, if you refuse to let them go, I will bring locusts into your country tomorrow. They will cover the face of the ground so that it cannot be seen. They will devour what little you have left after the hail, including every tree that is growing in your fields. They will fill your houses and those of all your officials and all the Egyptians. Something neither your fathers nor your forefathers have ever seen from the day they settled in this land till now. I'll come back to this later, but note that the Holovian race is very angel-coded and that, according to Herta, the family doesn't say a single word about the disappearance of Enna. After Enna, the prologue introduces us to Tazeronth, the Eon of Propagation. Note the descriptions of infant insects suckling the air. This allusion to babies will be relevant later. The saliva is equated to an ocean of soda with scents of orange, blood, and tropical fruits. The red butterfly's wings cause mild hallucinations, and Tazeronth is surrounded by countless assorted bugs that are on the verge of falling. Their blood is colourful, another important detail. Tazeronth produces countless new insect species at the same time that then reproduce with each other, creating even more new species. Sand King Tazeronth Part 1 introduces us to an unknown Genius Society member who was murdered by Polka Kakamond, whom we learn a lot more about in Golden Gears. They left behind a manuscript stating that an omen vanguard had successfully interpreted the somniloquy of the finality and then travelled around to share his findings. The important thing here is that the manuscript can jump up and punch us, and that the genius declared that someone gave him pills that claimed to be able to cure his stuttering disorder, but only made it worse. This combined information tells us that this poor genius was unknowingly subject to Aha, like many characters in this story. Aha is, of course, another major player in both Swarm Disaster and Golden Gears. Their influence is always very subtle, but they are responsible for and present at most of the major events, including even in-game events like the Battle vs. Fantilia, quietly laughing at us in the background. In Glimpses into the Beyond, we learn that Aha is not an eon that performs earth-shattering miracles, but rather is recognised as an eon who imperceptibly influences the movement of all living things, a description I find to be quite accurate. We learned in the original simulated universe that Aha is aware of the fact they are living in a simulation, something that is likely true for the real Aha too. The masked fools claim that Aha ascended when they climbed to the top of the imaginary tree and saw the stars operating like machinery and how the meaning of all things bows before nothingness. 
Aha continued looking until they saw a baby fall to the ground and cry because it had been wronged. They burst into laughter and that laughter still reverberates through the universe today. In the original simulated universe, we learn that at some point Aha wanted to trick Akavili, so they pretended to be human for more than a year, and then blew up half of the Astral Express and an entire planet. I think I should explain the rest of the lore in chronological order, because the way the game presents the information is intentionally confusing. In my attempts at making a timeline, I've worked out the general rule that the simulated universe uses three different names to make the order of events more comprehensible. Origin Universe refers to events that took place before the creation of the Swarm, with a few possible exceptions. Swarm Universe is during Tazeron's rampage, and Ember Universe describes things happening in the wake of the Swarm. I won't be able to provide an exact chronology of the events, as some of it is ambiguous or could be happening simultaneously with other events, but I'll try my best to be as accurate as possible. At an unknown time before everything else is Tragedy and Insects, the Dwindling of Stars. Here we introduce the path of veracity in the form of minuscule slime molds devouring depth crawlers much larger than themselves. They are on an irreversible path of veracity. This introduces the Eon Ouroboros, who is an entity from the void that wants to devour all life. They're a leviathan, and Klopoth appears to have made it their goal to prevent the veracity's return by constructing giant walls around literally everything. The IPC spreads their idea that the Dusk War, a war involving the Dusk Leviathan, ended with the birth of Klopoth, who they claim is the oldest Eon, but this is just IPC propaganda and is extremely unlikely to be true, especially since there is evidence that there was a Leviathan activity after Klopoth ascended. At another unknown time before other events in Part 5 of Gondola Helping Gods, we encounter Aha singing Universe About to Burn and on an Itos Cumin. Aha cares for nothing as long as this world is a mess. This should be revealing Aha is a clear antagonist and likely holds some truth to it, but remember that the simulated universe Aha is fully aware that it is a simulation, and that we are not the real Akavili, so this may be a trick intended for the audience. In fact, all of the events in the simulated universe may be tampered with, thus the entire simulation might not reflect what happened in reality at all. Two encounters with Eons take place in the Origin universe at an unknown time. First is an encounter with Ix the Nihility. The important takeaway here is that the presence of Ix makes a trailblazer feel very, very sleepy. Herta concludes that Ix shouldn't have an interest in Tazeron. This is interesting from a Peniconi perspective with the lore of Acheron, whose friend Frebus, inspired by Flebus the Phoenician in T.S. Eliot's Wasteland poem collection, dived into the abyssal whirlpool known as Ix and, of course, brings up questions about sleeping and why Ix would want people to be asleep, but I'll touch on that idea more later. In the next encounter, we are waiting for Yasha because Herta and Skrulum had a bet about whether or not Yasha was related to Tazeron due to some perceived similarities in their paths. While we wait, we start to hallucinate some strange hair growing and falling that causes us to laugh out loud in elation. This is an indicator that Aha is nearby and teasing us. At some point during the Origin universe, the Architects, a Nulls of Fortification, Part 1, reveals that Klopoth has been giving his Architects warnings to repair the barriers of multiple star systems urgently. The Architect doesn't know what this threat is and appears to spend most of his time lazing away. The warning was very likely regarding the imminent arrival of Ouroboros, Klopoth's arch enemy. Around a similar time, probably, in Tragedy and Insects, The Dwindling of Stars, Part 3, we encountered a squad of humans that once travelled the path of veracity and tried to locate their prey. They have a totem that they have carved on a stone tablet like a solemn ritual before a grand feast. They believed that reversing the magnetic poles of their knife and fork would lure the behemoths and allow the hunters to shrink themselves and dive into the gaping jaws. If we wait, the dramatic scene would unfold. Unfortunately for them, Genius Society regular experiments revealed that the ritual was misunderstood and would result in the hunters being devoured by the ancient Amoba slime molds that live within the giant monsters. We're also introduced to Nomadi the First, Ranmei's experimental ordinary human. The text implies he was one of these hunters who got himself devoured by slime molds by misinterpreting the ritual. Rest in peace, Nomadi the First. We're also introduced to the Beyond the Sky Choir. This is the choir said to make up the voice of Enna. We're introduced to a pair of twins that appear to be prisoners. The elder brother was thrust into the role of the crown prince, bearing the crown in the chaos. It is said that he would slay his brother, and the duet would have forever lost half of its voice. It is revealed that sitting straight with your waist at the right angle is the correct posture to greet a god, and also seems to allow you to join the Beyond the Sky choir and become a musical note of Enna's. 
The passage concludes with, when all of this ends, a dissonant interval is suddenly heard in the Beyond the Sky choir singing. It is said that this is when order and finality brush past each other. Enna is defined by their hymns, and finality is known for their backwards muttering, so these probably cancel each other out. It's unknown if this silence happened during the Origin universe, or if it is actually after the aforementioned fate of the older brother slaying the younger brother. I would like to point out now that I'm almost certain that this is the earliest iteration of Penacone when it was still a prison, or perhaps the prison that the inmates lived in before they were relocated to the current Penacone due to the memory bubble overflows. Either way, I think the story is discussing the relationship between Enna's angels, what are or would become the modern Holovians, and the IPC. Remember how I previously mentioned that Enna was inspired by the biblical god? Well, Klopoth is named after the evil version of the Tree of Kabbalah. Hoya has used the Tree of Kabbalah as inspiration before, and explaining the Tree of Kabbalah would be its own video, but understand that it's describing the realm of God and angels, and Klopoth is describing the forces of evil, sometimes referred to literally as the opposition. To expand on the previously mentioned story of the Ten Plagues, in this context the IPC as the opposition is playing the role of the Egyptians by capturing and forcing Anna's people to work. Origin Universe also introduces us to the Mourning Actors in the Gondola Helping Gods Part 1. One important detail to mention here is that the Mourning Actors are not masked fools. Mourning Actors loathe Alation, but Aha thought it'd be funny to empower them. So while they have Aha's blessing, they do not follow the path of Alation. Here, their gondola is full of very drowsy Mourning Actors. I suspect this drowsiness could be an indicator of Ix's presence. They are guarding a memory bubble that is later revealed to contain a shade of nihility, and proximity to the shade may be causing the drowsiness. We encountered a female morning actor who pulled down her mask before falling asleep to conceal the truth that she would start sleepwalking. In her dreams, she would behave erratically and wake up suddenly, oblivious to everything that had happened before. Now we get some plot happening in the reading of the Lepers Mat System, Massacre Saga, Sand King Tazeronth, and Bounty Hunter Crimson Cleansing Chronicle. It starts with Lepis Mat System Part 1, where we meet an unnamed major character that I'll be referring to as Crown Guy from this point onwards. Here, Crown Guy is the leader, and he talks about how he first discovered the uncivilized Lepis Mat System. Its surface teemed with insects. He is described as being awash in elation, the first clue that Aha is influencing him. He is described as always succeeding against all odds, which has filled him with avarice, hubris, and unwavering belief that he can conquer any planet and erect unprecedented civilizations. While he can get what he desires, he has never discovered what he wants. He invites a navigator who composes poetry to become his scribe. He reveals that he has an ailment that allows him to retain memories of only the most recent three days. He believes in half-deciphered whispers that are played in reverse, whispers of finality. He conquers planets, he establishes civilizations, he finds his lost self. It is the job of the navigator to record and remind him of certain whispers about Lepismat every three days. Though he doesn't know it yet, these whispers too are spread by Aha. Bounty Hunter Crimson Cleansing Chronicle Part 1 introduces us to the Bounty Hunters. They are headed towards a secret destination, led by a leader that supposedly has prestige comparable to Aha. They are an arrogant figure that has gained insight from nightmarish visions, and has insisted on embarking on an insect hunt at the Lepismat Plains. This is the same destination shared by Crown Guy. What could possibly go wrong? The leader here is a beautiful woman with blonde curls and an enchanting smile. She extended a hand to you and you had foreseen the consequences that would follow. That you would wake up the next day screaming in colourful goo, transformed into an insect. After she extended her hand, an unusual phenomenon followed soon after. All the shouting and clamour ceased before the hunt began, and the once boisterous bounty hunter camp fell eerily silent. Upon reaching the settlement, all you could see were insects crawling on the floor of their dwelling. The leader turned to face you, her blonde hair and weapon shimmered in the sunlight. We learn what is going on in Lepismat System Part 4. Crown Guy, just as the Whispers decreed, had established a civilization in the meantime. There was fighting outside a layer of impenetrable glass between insects and soldiers, and insects were plastered to the window by the winds. The stench of blood mixed with fragrance filled your nostrils. This was the scent associated with the swarm. Despite the gruesome scene before you, Crown Guy showed no signs of mercy. He beckoned the navigator to his side to chronicle his heroic deeds. It's revealed he caught a few different kinds of bugs. There were jelly drop-like lanoli worms with colourful hues by his feet, 
tiny Fitzgerald bugs on the table that were ruthless and elusive assassins that only revealed their true form under certain lighting conditions, and a tiger whose eyes never left your back in his hand. When Crown Guy had fallen asleep, the navigator released some of the worms to fly freely in the sky and find a safe place away from the flames of war. The tiger remained behind. Part 4 of San King Tezeron seems to take place in the far future but is kind of up for interpretation since it's categorised as part of the Origin universe and may indicate a samsara cycle is occurring. There are three shadows whose forms flicker between insects and people resembling Melchior's adopted sons. Perhaps they possess different souls. There is another name mentioned later, Melchizedek, and it seems that they're both named after a Christian figure called Melchizedek, and as you will see later, Melchizedek also adopts many children. Melchizedek is known for being the High Priest of God, and this name means King of Righteousness. Their name implies that the civilizations mentioned here are very loyal to Enna. Anyway, we see the lives of three of Melchior's adopted children. One is a nobleman who recorded something before falling into a crazed state. The Origin universe reveals that the swarm army originated from the Lepismat system and that some transformed into ground combat units, having sacrificed flight for colossal size and hardened carapaces. This knowledge drives you madder. The second child was a traveller who murmured to himself behind the glass wall after being confined. Inside his mind, he claims to have seen wonder beyond the scope of human imagination. He had seen dozens of insects intertwine and give birth to entirely new offspring, and equated them to a rose. This makes you feel drowsy. The third child is a murdered armed archaeologist who tells us that Lepismat was once a site of flourishing biodiversity, with multiple biological sexes coexisting to serve unique functions within the swarm. It's unclear which ones were responsible for reproduction during that era, but at some point the ancient insects gradually drifted towards the brink of extinction. Note that armed archaeologists are a part of the intelligentsia guild supported by the IPC. Bounty Hunter Crimson Clancy Chronicle Part 4 tells us more about how the bounty hunters from 10,000 light years away were flocking to Lepismat. Their leader, the blonde woman, claims they are there to compile insect charts. Before you could laugh, your visions become clouded by a sudden haze of smoke and you saw the sealed fate of the leader, that she would die at the hands of her own lover. As he flees, he leaves behind a delirious whisper. For bounty hunters with different paths, their blood is not of the same colour. But you are aware that this was a lie, because you can see her sanguine pool of blood and, when you sniff it, it does not smell of oranges. Basically, the lover was hallucinating that the leader was part of the swarm and assassinated her under the assumption, but was wrong. The last entry in the Origin universe is San King Tezeroth Part 7. Here, from the perspective of an Elidignan soldier, we learn of an unprecedented massacre and the onset of all that was to follow. I believe the Elidignan army is the one created by Crown Guy. There was a conflict that happened with the bounty hunters and some insects were being utilised by the army as weapons due to their self-replication features. Corpses of humans and insects littered the landscape. In the middle of the battle, the event that heralded the advent of a new age occurred. The swarm abruptly ceased their flight and began to reproduce before suddenly they hurtled off into the sky. An otherworldly entity appeared to be observing everything with its colossal eye. This entity is, of course, Anna the Order. This is continued in Part 5, the first entry in the official category of Swarm Universe. We learn of an isolated island called Mandolin Island. It seems to be named after mandalas, which are special circular shapes and patterns that depict the universe. Not only are these shapes used frequently across multiple religions, but Carl Jung believed these were an important part of the self-actualization process. Jung is credited with coining the idea of the collective unconscious. Basically, the idea that every person has an inherent psychic connection to each other that explains the similarities in myths and other practices that arise within isolated cultures. In that respect, it might be considered the true essence of humanity. He believed that insight into collective unconsciousness could be gleaned primarily from dreams, which served as a canvas for the unconscious mind. For Young, drawing mandalas was a critical tool for accessing the subconscious mind. The swarm is often regarded as an entity of pure instinct that functions as a hive mind, a bit like bees, but as you've probably realised by this point, the swarm is made up of transformed humans. Not unlike Franz Kafka's Metamorphosis, which is a novel that has been referenced many times by Hoyaverse, as discussed in my first video about Kafka, 
The collective unconscious, especially one accessed by dreams, is also a fairly obvious inspiration for the shared dream of Penacone and the ideals of Shipe, so you can see how this concept might progress in that respect. Mandolin Island is regarded later in part 2 as the place of destiny. The first world that the swarm descended upon after their ascension and the initial breeding ground of the swarm. We see this happening in part 5 as an influx in the number of human newborns reaches an all time high. These infants turned into bugs, resulting in swarms emerging in the skies all over La Pole Major. It takes 21 days for transport ships to arrive at Mandolin Island to evacuate survivors, but there is one woman who refuses to leave. This woman is Melkadek. You barge into her house and discover that she has toddler shoes scattered on her floor and you realise her children have left with the swarm and will never return. She asks you to leave. 24 nights later, she discovers an insect crawling through a slit in her window and raises it as her own child. She teaches it to walk, to put on shoes, and even to speak with all her heart. Seven days later, her house is flooded with her new children, although none of them can put on shoes for themselves. Much later, during the Ember universe, we experienced a flashback where we learned of her fate. Malkadek's home was destroyed by the swarm and inside of her home, there were 87 tiny garments and over 7,000 pairs of little shoes. She had been waiting for her children to return until her food had been depleted and everything outside had been devastated. She had stumbled, opened the door and cast herself into the darkness that enveloped the sky, ultimately, in her loneliness and desperation, becoming part of the swarm herself. And so the swarm disaster has officially begun. And with that, I will conclude the first video. In part two, I'll be covering the events leading up to the end of Tazeronth and the creation of Shipe. Hopefully it won't take too long, but the simulated universe lore can be challenging to decode and I have to do all of it myself with some peer review from my lore friends. In saying that, some of the content is bound to require future amendments and additions as we learn more. So check the comments section for that. Alright, see you guys next time.